and a basic need, therefore, of your staff. So what I found is before staff want to know what you know, they want to know that you respect them. That will open their ears to the information you're trying to share. Everyone desires respect. Everyone needs to be heard. That principle is not about listening to the words that are being said, but it's about trying to understand the perspective. And understanding a person's perspective is different than agreeing. So as a supervisor, a manager, and a, or an administrator, if I can listen to you long enough to show you that I understand your perspective, even if I disagree, that gives us uh, some a strong foundation to move forward. Because everyone wants to be understood. Everyone has strength. It's a third principle. Everyone that you supervise has a strength. And the quicker we can identify that strength and attach it to a task that needs to be done, it helps that person to see that you value them. And, and if they embrace that they are valued, often they show up differently, which then makes the unit, the division, and the agency stronger because everyone has strengths. Judgment, judgments can wait. Um, that's a challenging one because sometimes as supervisors, administrators, managers, we don't want to um, admit that we have judgments. I offer that everyone makes judgments every day. And this principle is not about um, stop. It's not asking you to stop making judgments. It's inviting us to make our judgments light enough so that when new and relevant information comes forth, we can hear it. And we can use that information to determine how we need to move forward. Um, there are times when we have made judgment about a person who works with us or for us that stops us from having effective relationships and partnerships. And so judgments can wait is asking us to loosen up those judgments enough so that we can take on some new and relevant information that, that might make the partnership better. The fifth principle is partnership power. We often talk about partnerships. And in every partnership, there's a differential of power, whether it's a director and an administrator or an administrator and a supervisor, a supervisor and their employee or the employee and a customer or client. There is a power differential. And if we really want to partner with that person, we must lower our power enough so that other person can see themselves having power, i.e. having a voice, being willing to share their thoughts, feeling like they have as much at stake for the success of, of a project or a task as the other person that they're working with. Partners share power. The last principle is partnership is a process. This principle is really about the fact that even though we intend to do all of the principles, on any given day we will fall short. I embrace the principles. I've trained the principle, principles. And on if, any given day, I fall short. And I have to remind myself that this is a process. And as long as I'm failing forward, and that's a term that I really embrace, it means that I am getting it right sometimes, and I'm learning from my mistakes, and I'm moving forward and doing it better the next day and the next day. So I invite you to, to be open to the Sixth Principle Partnership. Recognize that it is a process. That some days you're going to feel like you were on it and you, you really embraced the partnerships and people felt that you respected them, that you heard them, that you shared power, and, and that they really could feel you embracing the partnership. And on other days, you might not do as well. And it's a process. Hang in there. Keep working at it. That's exactly right. And um, so I'm wondering. Thank Thanks for the overview of those principles, Catherine. I'm wondering, you know, it's so we talk about principles all the time. And so I'm wondering in Durham DSS, how do you remind each other of these principles from time to time? 
I will go back. Uh, I'll give you a couple um, examples. Uh, about two months ago, I had planned to have a quick meeting with um, some of my staff. These staff happen to be ones who um, do training in my um, in my agency. And I had some really good news I wanted to share with them, and I was so excited about meeting with them, and we were going to have a quick meeting right before lunch um, for me to give them the good news and to move forward. But during the meeting, a concern came up that I was not expecting. And after a lengthy conversation, I walked away, first of all, hungry. Again, it was supposed to be a short meeting right before lunch. Um, and feeling like I didn't show up my best. After lunch, I met with the director of our agency, Michael Beckett. And I discussed with him the meeting and what I thought staff was asking and trying to share with me. And together, he and I came up with a plan that would afford the training staff the opportunity to meet with program leaders and share their vision um, for training. And later on in the webinar, we'll come back to this um, issue of, of letting the, the stakeholders share and be a part of the discussion. That afternoon, I went back to my office and I sent them an email acknowledging what happened in the meeting. Um, and I brought a short excerpt from the email. Actually, it's just the, the, um, the first line or two from the email. And I simply said to them, good afternoon. Let me read this. During lunch, I had a chance to reflect on our meeting. And I wanted you to know I truly heard you and I understood your frustration. Then I went on to tell them what was going to happen because I truly heard them and understood their frustration. So I attached my acknowledgment to a course of action that matched. For me, it was important to demonstrate respect of the issue they were trying to raise and to be clear their perspective um, was understood and that I wanted to share power with them by bringing them to the table for them to share their own point of view. I go back to partnership is a process. I didn't get it right in that um, meeting. I knew it. I evaluated what happened. And I took a course of action to try to get us back on track. Uh, another example. Um, our director writes a monthly article in our local newspaper about what's happening at DSS. Um, these articles are wide reaching and are intended to give the reader a real sense of the work we do, the challenges we face, and how they can partner with us for success um, for our community and the families we serve. A few months ago, he decided to take the six principles of partnership and build his articles around one or two principles each month until we had spoke to each principal. This becomes a real way for us to show our agency and the community that we really do want to operationalize these principles, um, that these principles are doable. They're not lofty goals, but they're things that can really uh, show up in the work we do and how we do our work. Um, and so we're excited about those articles and introducing the six principles of partnership to our community in Durham. Another very simple example, and I think we have a picture of the t-shirt, on Fridays is Dress Down Day in Durham County. And so tomorrow, you may come to our agency and see um, um, folk walking around with these um, t-shirts on. We felt like it's we feel like it's really important to have a visible reminder of the six principles of partnership. So whether that's a poster, a T-shirt, whatever you decide to do, whatever whatever principles you decide to embrace, you want to find a way to breathe life into them and to help yourself and your staff see how they show up in the work that we do. So those are some examples of the things we do in Durham County. 
That's great, Catherine. Thank you so much for sharing um, those concrete examples. I think many ca um, counties have really embraced those principles um, of partnership and also need a framework in which to put those principles as well as practice uh, great leadership and how to put that all together. Well, looking at technical and adaptive work really helps us create that framework. Across the board, leaders are being faced with challenges and very rapid change. With every change we're asked to make, there are two kinds of challenges that we're asked to conquer. We're asked to conquer those that are technical and those that are adaptive. For leaders especially, it's important to know the difference because each requires a different response, a way to lead, a different way of showing up. So um, this is a, a list of some characteristics of technical work. Catherine, can you help us define technical and adaptive problems and challenges? Sure, I'll start with technical, because I think most of the work we've done in income maintenance um, prior to NCFAS was really uh, around technical work. And technical work can be some of the easiest um, work or, or changes to manage. Technical problems have a solution. They're, the solution is available. There's a target discussion. People are focused in on the solution. You understand the problem and you understand the solution. You feel like you could solve the problem by yourself or tell someone else what you need them to do or maybe solicit an expert in the field to, to address an issue or change that needs to occur, to occur. The bottom line distinction is that when it's a technical problem, there is a known solution. You know how to fix the problem, as opposed to when it's an adaptive challenge or, or um, change. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Technical work, um, the perspectives are aligned. The definition of the problem is clear. Solution and implementation of the problem is clear. And the primary locus of responsibility for organizing the work is the leader. Perspectives are aligned, the very first one on the slide. It really sounds like everyone agrees what the problem is. Is that what it's talking about? Exactly. You walk in the room, you have a meeting, everyone is very clear about what the problem is and what needs to be changed or what needs to occur. Exactly. The others seem fairly straightforward, but I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more or talk a little bit more about the last one, the locus of responsibility. What does that mean? That means that the responsibility for solving the problem lies with the supervisor, the leader, the manager, the person in charge, or the expert that has been identified to address the issue. That's what the locus of responsibility refers to. And so um, from your experience, um, what would be an example of a technical problem or challenge, perhaps one related to NCFAST? Wow, there's been so many <laughs> problems related to NCFAST. Um, let me think of one that we've been able to solve from a technical standpoint. Um, I, I guess I would say the coding of day sheets. Um, before we coded day sheets um, based on percentage of time on the activity that you did. And with NCFAS, the change that occurred was that it had to be um, person specific. And so that was a technical change. We understood how to make the change happen, which meant that we had to identify the client that we um, were working with, the activity that we um, did whether it was a recertification or application and the amount of time spent. So we walked in the room understanding what the change was. We had an understanding of how we needed to make the change happen. We were able to resolve it and move forward. And the supervisor is responsible to ensure that his or her staff code um, their work correctly monthly. I think that's a very universal example of a technical change in the world of NCFAS. 
So can you tell us about the relationship to leaders being experts? Um, do all leaders need to be experts? This is a challenging question because I think the very nature of a leader makes you want to be and feel the need to be an expert. And we've struggled and talked a lot about this in um, Durham County. And I think the first thing we had to recognize is to honor the fact that people um, struggle with losing some of their expertise and to highlight that it's okay, that you still have levels of expertise, but now in this changing, complex, dynamic, ever-increasing um, um, world of complexity that you have expertise in some areas, but there's no way to be the expert. And I think that's the difference, that you don't have to be the expert, and yet you can still honor the expertise in your history that you bring forth as you move more into adaptive work. So where can, so where can, where can we go wrong as leaders? I, what I found is that one of the um, places that you can quickly go wrong with as a leader is using technical solutions for adaptive problems. Um, and we have a slide up that I hope most of you can see now. Um, and it says the single most common reason for leadership failure is when people in position of authority treat adaptive changes like technical problems, apples and oranges. They, it is very different. While each change or problem has an element of both, you have to tease out the difference so that you can get a handle on what path or approach you need to take to resolve the problem. So we're really kind of working into looking at adaptive um, challenges now. Um, and so can we look at what characterizes adaptive problems and how do we know when we have them? Sure. Adaptive challenges all involve an element of change. In order to truly deal with an adaptive problem or change, you have to find a way often to change the heart of people or their beliefs or the culture that you used to work in or the structures that you have and sometimes even the, the very principles that you use. This is very um, different. This is more that transition period where you really need to have people engaged and fully involved and willing to internally change the way they think, the way they show up in order for the change to really happen and be effective. And here's why. You have lots of perspectives. What are perspectives? Different ideas, different points of views, different ways that people want to solve the problem. The challenge or the change itself is not clear. You're not exactly sure what is it we have to do or what is the actual um, solution for the problem. And you can't agree often exactly what the problem is. So if you don't have the solution, everyone is not clear, you have to be able to facilitate people doing a lot of internal work about how am I going to be open to hearing what other people are saying and recognizing that the problem is not clear. And as the leader, you have to do the most work on yourself because the, the answer often does not reside with you. It often resides with others. Often it's with many other people i.e., you need to be open to bringing a lot of people around the table and, and be open to facilitating a lot of voices being heard in order to resolve an adaptive change or problem. Excellent. Excellent. And, and the next slide really shows us a, a very simple uh, or simplistic breakdown of what illustrates the difference between technical and adaptive uh, problems or challenges. I'm curious about the percentage of time folks would give to each of these in their current leadership challenges. Um, so let's do another polling question, if you would. Can't get that over. Can you get it? Ah, oh, there you go. All right, so here's our other polling question. On a scale of one to five, how effective do you feel you are as a leader in your current position? Effective. Let's 
We quickly see the tallies coming in. Most people look to be in the middle, uh, slightly more in the upper range, threes and fours. I'll give you just another minute. And that's great. So yeah, I think that's um, pretty normal for us to feel sort of in the middle. It's like, yeah, we know we can do better, but we're, we're pretty effective as we are, always have um, a great deal more to learn. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that we can move into talking more about the adaptive changes that you all have experienced. Um, Catherine, I'm wondering, is there one thing about moving NC fast forward in Durham that you can recall might have been an actual adaptive challenge that was met with sort of a technical solution. Uh, just walk us through what one might look like um, or how you experienced it and then how you might have backed up in order to address the problem or challenge differently. I think I will continue to talk about training because in the beginning we had um, discussion at nauseam about how intuitive NCFAS system would be how much knowledge, how much um, policy would staff need to know. And um, it was clear the solution was not in the room. Um, we all had different perspectives. And yet we could not be paralyzed by that. So we made a choice, and I'm not sure if we were making a conscious choice to take the technical path, but that's cl clearly what we did in hindsight. And so we said what we do know is that staff who do FNS need to know Medicaid, and staff who do Medicaid need to know FNS. So we started training those staffs on the other programs. Um, clearly a technical decision. This is what we're going to do. As we have moved forth with training, and we've been training at nauseam before we even knew what or why we were training, um, but again, we felt the need to move forward. And I go back to failing forward. What has happened is that while we have made a lot of mistakes, we are so far along down the road in ensuring our staff have um, trainers in multiple programs. And yet, going back to my example of meeting with my training staff, when we met with them and they brought all of the um, program leaders to the table, they were able to share information, give us um, different perspectives that really is beginning to change how we view training. And now I feel like we are on the adaptive path. Um, we are recognizing that the solution and the answer to some of our training questions cannot and does not lie with leadership. It lies with the people doing the training and the people receiving the training. So I'm thankful for where we are, and we have definitely learned a lot as we journey on this technical and adaptive path. That's great. We, we also have another polling question, which relates a little bit more to um, the uh, adaptivity of leadership challenges. So the question is for everybody, what percentage of your leadership challenges as an income maintenance supervisor are adaptive? So now that you know a little bit more about technical versus adaptive challenges, uh, what percentage of your job do you think is adaptive? 51 to 75 percent looks like it's winning the race. Um, yeah, wow, that's really, that's a significant part of everybody's job. And I, I wonder if um, that would, that's changed or, or if that would have been the same answer, say, even five, five to seven years ago. Um, I would suspect not, not quite so high. Uh, it has definitely gotten a little more adaptive, a little less clear in terms of our, um, not just the problem, but, but the solutions. So thanks for taking the poll. That's, uh, wow, 80. 80% have answered um, between 51 and 75% of your jobs. Great. Wow. 
That's a high percentage. That is a high percentage. I'm going to move on to our next slide to talk a little bit more about um, adaptive change or challenge. We use those words sort of interchangeable, interchangeably. Um, this is a fairly straightforward chart, too. And I'm curious about the last block. We really are talking about what the work is. Um, and then who does the work in this chart. And as you can see, a technical problem is really about applying current know-how um, and the experts, the usual experts um, that, that we have that are specialized in um, solving those problems are who does the work. In technical and adaptive, we're both uh, learning new ways to do things and, and both experts and stakeholders do the work. But if you notice the last block about adaptive change, we're learning new ways, and that's what the work really is. And who does the work are the stakeholders. So I want to talk a little bit more about who these stakeholders are. Um, and can you talk, tell us a little bit more about stakeholders in this scenario, Catherine? Yeah, I think that um, from my experience, it's really important to think about who are the stakeholders. And then how do you get their voices um, at the table so that they can inform the process? Often what we're learning is they need to do more than inform the process. They need to drive it and really give information and instructions and become the gateway to provide solutions. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's different. Um, that's, a, that's a change in the system. And so from ensuring that our trainers are at the table providing information to the staff who are being trained, which are the true um, stakeholders of, of the training that we're trying to develop, we've learned that. Then if you move into a, a, another area, whether it's having the reception staff who are, who are stakeholders in the decisions that are being made and often are not at the table. Um, we're trying to address that issue and, and ensure they're at the table and make sure that we're listening to the stakeholders. Um, because what we have found is that often we miss a key element or a key step or a key point of, of clarity that would have resolved the issue months ago. I know we've often heard as leaders, if they would just ask me, I could have told them, adaptive change and challenges is requiring us to do just that. And so if we can start there, you know, highly effective people start with the end in mind. If we can start there by asking the stakeholders and by inviting them to the table and ensuring that we are um, facilitating their voice being heard, it really makes a difference when you're dealing with an adaptive change or challenge. And so really what I hear you saying is that an important stakeholder in the process of adaptive challenges are those that are closest to the work itself. Um, and Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, and so I wonder, you know, it, given that scenario, what is the role of a leader during adaptive challenges? The role of the leader mainly becomes to be the facilitator and the convener of um, bringing people together. Um, you, you really, as a leader, want to facilitate good dialogue. You want to make sure the voices around the table are being heard. As a leader, it's my job to navigate that process and to bring people in and, and empower them to have a voice and encourage them to use their voice. Um, you really become the organizer rather than the expert. What I would like, what I like to say as it relates to struggling with being an effective leader during an adaptive change or challenge is that I'm measured by the questions that I ask, not the information that I give. So I walk away asking myself, did I ask the right questions? Did I provoke conversation? Did I invite people in? Did I balance the room? Did I allow the perspectives to be heard and understood? Um, did I encourage um, difference of opinion so that we could grow from other perspectives? 
for me, that becomes the role of an effective leader when you're dealing with an adaptive challenge or change and not necessarily, and not, let me not say not necessarily, and not have, having to have the answer and being the expert. I think we've um, heard very similar things echoed from the various counties that we've asked their responses specifically about NCFAST. And largely, um, that was under the, the title of sort of lessons learned. Many of the counties came back and responded that the most um, that they had learned about leadership during these times was that leaders really had to be more flexible. They needed to know how to communicate better. They needed to know how to engage have better listening skills, and really ask important questions that provide an open space for input. And, and that's what you all sort of shared with us. Um, we've also heard some, some really sort of innovative um, solutions that you all have come up with in terms of adaptive challenges. Uh, one county uh, wrote to us about a buddy system between workers, uh, which is really sort of, an I, I think, an adaptive solution to a, an adaptive problem, um, providing buddies to, to work and, and really sort of uh, help each other out and provide support. Um, I'm also wondering. Uh, with your your practice with NCFAST, your experience, um, that you've already shared a lot of those experiences that you've had, Catherine, with NCFAST. Um, can you talk about um, a few more te technical or adaptive changes that you've experienced specifically with NCFAST? Well, I just I'm just going to reiterate, and I think um, I'll counties have had this experience is that we quickly recognized with NCFAS that we did not um, have the, the answers to the problems that we were facing. Um, we couldn't even keep up with the problems that we were facing. And so instead of being prescriptive and sending out directives and trying to um, instruct um, staff on what to do, we decided about a year and a half ago to um, have what we called um, Tuesday morning meetings. We weren't creative, it's just that they happen on Tuesday mornings. And um, um, we met every Tuesday morning. Um, most at meetings, the director facilitated the meetings, and um, we had representation from all staff that were impacted by NCFAS. Um, we always had a standing agenda because we wanted to make sure that we had some parameters for the meeting because when we get together, as I'm sure everyone can imagine, there's always a lot we could talk about where we wanted to be really focused on um, the challenges and the changes that we were facing based on NCFAS. And then we would include a hot topic or issue of that of the week. And again, we tried to narrow it down to that that week because there were constantly things happening and changing that could pull our focus. Um, and we felt really good about the work we were doing and the way we were communicating and how eclectic and broad the group was. Um, and then we w were assessing um, one day who was at the table and we realized while we had representation from the work level of our income maintenance staff, um, we did not have representation um, from the reception staff, nor did we have representation from our staff who managed our mail, two areas that are critical to our success in NCFAS. Um, and so their managers were there, their supervisor was there, but as we said earlier with a, a adaptive challenge, the supervisor, the manager, the leader is not the locus of the change. They're, we need to have the stakeholders, the people who are closest to the work at the table. We address that deficiency. Um, we were transparent with them and acknowledged that we did not have them at the table and that it was an oversight, um, that we had made a mistake. Um, we invited them to the table. We asked um, the staff in those areas to pick a representative um, to represent them at the table. We helped them facilitate a communication loop so that 
they would um, share information to their representative and vice versa. The, inf the representative would share information back to that work group so that we can continue to grow and learn and realize how we needed to be successful as an agency um, as it relates to NCFAS. So again, we are on a journey trying to understand the difference between adaptive and technical leadership. We are trying to layer that understanding over top of the principles that already guide how we operate. And every day, we are intentional about trying to, trying to do it better and better. Um, and it's, it's, it's been a process. It truly has been a process. A process indeed. I'm sure that um, there are lots of folks out there that um, all of the things that you've talked about really resonate with. And so at this point, um, at the risk of having 170 people um, Go ahead and um, okay, folks. I just want you to know I went into a long thing that I had my mute on, so you didn't hear any of it. So uh, <laughs> that's all right. I'll start again. Um, so using your chat pod, we're going to ask you to um, to talk to us and share with us some of your things um, that that some of this resonates with you in terms of NC Fast and the changes and challenges, both technical and adaptive, that you are currently um, challenged with or have been in the past. Catherine shared a great deal of her experiences with us, and so we're just wondering what some of your experiences have been. So feel free to use your chat box um, at the risk of opening this up to 170-some folks who are signed on. But go ahead. John's got quite a chore for uh, keeping track of everything. We'll try to respond um, and uh, highlight some of the things that we see coming over the screen. And while uh, folks are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and um, ask Catherine another question. Uh, I, I wonder, you know, we hear, we've talked a lot about technical and adaptive change. And as leaders, what, what are the things that you hope folks will walk away from, from today's webinar with? I guess a couple of the points that I hope um, we can all walk away with is that um, we, we are facing and have faced quite a challenge and that if we can um, embrace some new skills, some new way of thinking, a new way of showing up, that it we may find um, ways to move forward more effectively, um, adaptive and technical um, challenges and ways to manage those is one um, tool. Um, what I found um, as a leader is that I constantly need to add to my toolbox and I need to be okay with learning how to add that tool and learning how to use that tool. Um, and sometimes it's okay to invite people up to be a part of your learning. And what I mean by this is to simply be transparent and say, I want to show up differently. I want to invite you to, to the table more. I want to hear your voice voice more. And, and we can all um, learn t together and be OK with not having to be the expert of everything, not having to know everything. It's an aha moment when you can just release some of that. It doesn't mean we don't have a job to do. It doesn't mean we don't have a lot of expertise. It just means that we can open up the conversation, the ideas, the solutions to more people so we can share in the challenges that we face as it relates to NCFAST. Absolutely, and some of those things I'm seeing, you know, pop up on the screen here. So, uh, answer or 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 some some things that are being shared around technical challenges that you've encountered with NCFAS. Uh, we see lots coming in in terms of. Um, uh, inadequate or lack of reports, how to implement training amongst programs without a dedicated training staff. That's a huge challenge, I would imagine. Um, how to complete Medicaid recertifications in NCFAS. Let's see. Um, let's see if we have, do you want to talk about the training challenge? That's, that's right up your alley. 
It, it, it is a challenge, and I recognize in Durham County we do have the luxury of having dedicated um, training staff, and I definitely recognize that is a luxury. Um, and yet we um, still find training to be a challenge because we cannot uh, afford to have staff in training six weeks like we used to do in the good old days. And so we are still trying to figure out what does it um, mean. Um, one of the things I've found in terms of not having a dedicated training staff, a lot of counties are, are using um, those staff who are experts on the floor. And I think you mentioning buddying up with that person. Um, we have actually um, had some counties um, come to um, Durham County and observe some of the training um, process that we have in place. We did that. We went to several counties when we were trying to figure out how to move forth with training. Um, and so often we have to partner with each other as counties, too, to try to move forth in this process. Um, it, it is not an, it is and has not been an easy um, challenge at all for us to undertake. Absolutely. I, I was looking here. Um, it, it just made me realize that, uh, you know, we talk about technical challenges um, and, and we sort of make it sound like they're a little bit easier than adaptive challenges. But, you know, as Susan Epley says, and she reminds us that even some of the most technical challenges that we have can be really, really difficult to solve. Um, hers is uh, making sure all staff applying, that all staff for applying current and see fast changes. I mean, just something as as seemingly simple as that. Yeah, and that reminds me. I would um, I've come to appreciate that easy um, or simple doesn't mean easy. Um, I use the analogy of trying to lose weight. It's pretty simple. If we eat less and exercise more, we can lose weight. But I have found that has not been a simple <laughs> task. So I'm real clear the difference between easy and simple, and none of the work we do um, in income maintenance is um, simple or easy, depending on what perspective or, or task we have to take. Yeah, many of the things that folks are writing here and the things that, that we've heard from folks out in the county have um, really sort of it, a lot of technical issues just around sort of how to manage information and communicate. Um, and, and I think we talked a little bit about the role of the leader really shifting to, you know, being that person that can filter some of that information and, and give it back to staff in a way that they can sort of of tackle one at a time in a manageable kind of way. Um, many, many, many folks that I've talked to and heard from through this have said one of the major problems and challenges that they had to overcome was just staff being overwhelmed by information. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there's some other things here. Let's see. Large challenge that NCFAST um, uh, the, is that NCFAST and the policy manuals are not married. The terminology of one doesn't match the other. That sounds like a pretty technical problem, yet pretty insurmountable at times. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we have. Um, we've got. Training, training, yes, absolutely. Um, computer skills, uh, just data entry and um, type of authorization systems, um, just some of the technology issues. Um, did you guys experience those? Um, we did, and we had to um, begin to look at how we were recruiting um, for the positions because NC FADS requires different skills than the way we used to do income maintenance. And so we've had, you know, we had to have conversation about so what are the skill sets that we're looking for now in an um, income maintenance worker um, and begin to fold it into the recruitment process. And then you have staff that are already on board that have to be tooled up. And it's definitely a process. Um, what we found is that the more staff worked in the system, the easier it, it was for them. It was um, more of the 
fear of the unknown and the natural resistance that comes with a change of that nature. Um, but it, certainly many conversations about how do we ensure staff are comfortable with the technical side um, of being of working in NCFAS, which is now part of your job as an income maintenance worker. Hi, that's wonderful. I, um, uh, the, Janine, I, I'm going to get your last name wrong, um, but she she chatted in that leadership now feels like being a symphony conductor. <laughs> yes, beautiful. <laughs> I will I agree. <laughs> I'm going to use that from now on. Thanks, Janine. Um, let's see. We've got some other things. Uh, we'll take maybe another one before we move on. Um, uh, too many workarounds, changes from, from day to day. We've heard lots of that. Um, these are all, again, seemingly technical difficulties, yet, yet very challenging to overcome. Um, deadlines, um, uh, let's see, lack of timely communication from state on issues within NCFAST. And, and, you know, even at every level, folks are um, really sort of challenged by trying to, to overcome both the technical and adaptive aspects of all of this. Um, let's see, Betty Jo said, I would like to know how many counties started out total universal and realized they needed to pull back and look at the entire picture. That's an interesting question. Yeah, um, we didn't start out totally universal, but that was our goal. And as I said earlier, we jumped in training everybody on whatever program they were not familiar with because our end game was to be totally universal. And yes, Betty, we've had to pull back and look at the entire picture and and um, figure out what really makes sense based on now what we know of NCFAS. And so we are having those conversations and determining what does universal really mean as it relates to being successful in NCFAS. Yeah, that's right. We've um, we've added up here now uh, adaptive challenges, and we'll take a few uh, examples of adaptive challenges and talk to those a little bit. Go ahead and um, post some of your adaptive challenges, uh, Susan. Quick, your quick, Susan. Uh, one of the most challenging adaptive challenge is lack of control. Whereas we knew what was needed previously, and now, yeah, we don't really know the answer. Knowing, uh, not knowing the answer, is a frightening place to be. Uh, ditto to Susan. How to organize and rearrange staff, changing um, our culture to meet the volume. Absolutely. We have heard those things over and over again, even just inside agencies and how to organize ourselves um, differently so that we can meet the needs of, of customers. Managing the stress level is is absolutely key. I, it, most everybody that talks about NCFAS talks about the stress of their workers. Uh, have you guys um, oh, done some things? Yeah, we de we definitely experienced that, and um, you know we've um, one of the main things that we've done um, is to pull staff together and actually. Um, reflect on some of the successes that we've had um, because we we found ourselves constantly pushed up against um, deadlines um, that the state was saying this has to be done in these many days um, just like what we're currently facing now with the 90 days and what you begin to do is get so focused on what hasn't been done that you lose sight on the progress that you have made and so we actually just stopped um, one day and was very intentional about acknowledging where we started in NCFAS, what we have learned, and what the successes that we've had, and how that has brought us down the road on our path to being efficient and effective in NCFAS. And then, and we had all the staff in the agency who who, ha who have a role in NCFAS from the reception desk up to the director. And that was just a really um, 
good moment to reflect and acknowledge the stress that comes with the journey that we've, we've been on. Um, what, another thing we've also done is to say that um, we're going to take the best information we have today, make a good decision, and that tomorrow when we get new information, we'll make a better decision. And to use that to sort of bring down the emotions around the, these constant changes that we have no control over. So yes, we did this yesterday and we organized this way yesterday. And yes, today we need to organize a different way because we have new information and it's okay. It's not that we got it wrong yesterday. We just ad addressed the need that was in front of us yesterday and today there's a different need, more information. So those are just some of the the ways that we have been trying to um, address some of the stress that comes from NCFAS. And, and I love the, the new frame on, you know, it's okay to make a mistake. Um, and that really helps with the whole uh, control issue that, you know, before we were, we seemingly felt like we had control. And, and now we don't know what changes are coming. We don't know how quickly they're going to come. And that lack of control is unsettling. But to give ourselves and our staff permission to sort of um, make mistakes and, and act on new information as it comes available is, is a great frame, I think. I think um, we've got a lot of folks that sort of chimed in both now and um, earlier talking about how uh, this was really a chance for them to learn things about their staff yes. um, that they didn't know strengths that their staff have that they would have never discovered had this um, NCFAS not not come about. Um, and then other workers that, that really, you know, realized this was not a good fit for them um, and, and had to make other arrangements, but to, to really begin sort of um, uh, elevating people's strengths that, that maybe weren't elevated before. Um, so I love that. Lots of good adaptive challenges um, and and things that I have heard over and over again. So so I guess the message to everybody is you're not alone um, in any of these things that, that you're experiencing or have experienced um, in the past. I want to talk just a little bit more about this. Um, leadership issue um, because we're all leaders here and, and the, the thing we want you to, to leave with is, you know, what can I do to be a better leader even given the fact that this is, uh, I know now a little bit more about what a technical and adaptive solution, uh, problem and solution is. As a leader, what are my roles specifically and, and how can I go about sort of changing what I do on a daily basis um, to accommodate those? Um, can you just pick a couple of these, Catherine, and provide some examples? We've got up on the slide, uh, these are some, some characteristics of adaptive leaders. Uh, leaders are, uh, during adaptive challenges, do a lot of assessing. They do a lot of managing. I would add to that communication and, and information, managing both of those. Distributing, providing contexts for people. Um, as I said earlier, sort of providing and building containers for information. Um, building relationships. Um, having self-awareness is certainly key to anything that we do as leaders. Um, and keeping what's essential and building from it. And I really like that. So that the essential things that we do, the really good things that we do, we keep and we harness and we build upon that. And, um, and, and that last point is really sort of, for me, uh, captured in the, the quote from Ronald Heifetz um, beside it that says, as in nature, a successful adaptation enables an organization or a community to take the best from its traditions, identity, in history into the future. And I really see it as that process of adaptation. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I think that the more that we can allow ourselves and our staff to, again, as I shared, own the fact that we are grieving the expertise that we had, grieving what we knew how to do really well grieving the fact that we really knew how to provide good customer service and ensure our clients and our customers got their benefits on time and it was correct. And that the world around us has changed and we have to assess that changing world and assess the information that we have 
and began to learn how to manage as I shared based on what we know today and not be paralyzed by what we don't know. Um, you know, most of us have been waiting for the state to get the policy right, give us the right information, and I've, and we those things have not played out the way we had anticipated. And so we have to then set based on what we know, the information that we have, the um, responsibility that we have, what do we do to move forward? And a part of that, I really like the building relationship um, because a part of that moving forward is that we have to trust ourselves and our staff to do the best we can with the information and the knowledge that we have and then be open to what we need to know and what we need to learn. Um, and that we are, we are going to make some mistakes because this is this is a new um, territory. It's a new um, way of being. Um, we have staff who who could probably do their jobs in their sleep before NCFAS, and now they find themselves on quicksand. That's hard. Um, that's challenging. And the more we can acknowledge that and help them to remember that even though NCFAS is different you still know policy. You still have a lot of knowledge. And so it's about pulling that knowledge forward and coupling it with new information and to continue to try to meet the needs of our um, customers. So it's, it's a challenge. Um, it's a, a totally um, different way of being a leader. Um, and I'm confident that we will adapt we will change, we will build new skill, skills, and we will uh, move forward. And the more we get the information that we need in order to do that, the better the situation will be. Yeah, that you know that it is such a positive frame, and and um, I'm just gonna invite folks at this point to sort of chime in with um, questions that they have uh, that they want to ask uh, Catherine or myself um, or each other for that matter. And I, I just really want to start with the last comments that have been made on the chat box about customer service and really feeling like uh, the stress of workers not feeling like they can't provide great customer service because they can't give answers about benefits. Um, they can't even, you know, be sure about the date at which they can provide those answers and, and the stress of that, but overall feeling badly about not being able to deliver great customer service. Can you speak to that? Absolutely, because because they're on the front line and they're they're receiving the the, the calls and the concerns and the worries and so um, we just have to acknowledge that and we have to make sure that our staff know that we know they're doing the best that they can do. But that's their intent. Intent is to provide good customer service. And when they're not able to do that, um, it's, when it's a system issue, that we can separate the difference from the system, the system not allowing us to provide good service versus the person not being effective at their job. That it's not the person, it's the system. Um, I think that that is really important for people to um, feel that distinction yeah. so that it doesn't feel like I'm not doing right. my job and that you can recognize and that you can honor the fact that they really want to be able to provide um, good customer service. And it, and it, I love a statement, it, it, it feels bad. It absolutely it feels bad. bad. Yep. And let's see, we've got uh, Vicki typing. I invite others to chime in. Uh, questions, comments um, that you have? Uh, while we wait for those, um, I, uh, I'll invite you to um, sign up if you'd like for the next webinar that's taking place next week. We'll just do a plug for that right now while we're waiting for folks. Um, it is uh, going to take place next Wednesday, 
same time, 12 to 1.30. And it's going to really sort of continue this conversation. This is not a prerequisite for um, next week. So if you've got other folks in your agency that haven't joined um, in today, it's fine. They can join in tomorrow. We'll try to catch up with a little bit of review from what we've talked about today, um, but then talk a little bit more about adaptive leadership and what is the work of a leader in times of adaptive change. And we're going to explore six specific strategies strategies um, next week. We're going to talk about that. And so we've got a few people sort of coming in. Comments, questions? Um, I wish we had the time to really attend to, to everybody's um, comments uh, about what they're going through um, with, um, with NC Fast challenges. I appreciate all of those for sure. Um, and John is reminding us of the link that we can use to register. Um, so let's just So here's a question um, for all of you. Has sharing information from agency to agency been useful um, as a strategy for you all, uh, specifically as it relates to NC Fast? That's a great question. And we're ha anybody can join in and answer that question. Has it been helpful to share information? Thank you for providing these sessions. Uh, it does help to hear that our issues are shared in many agencies, especially our deep concern for our staff who have faced so many challenges. Absolutely. And, and if nothing else, Rebecca, we just hope that you know it provides a forum for you all to understand that nobody's out there alone. I understand that the challenges that you face are unique to your counties, but the challenges as a, as a whole um, are, are being experienced by everybody, for sure. And we hope that we can continue more. Um, if these are very helpful for you, please let your directors know. Um, please let um, you know anybody that you talk to at the state know how helpful this is. Uh, we would love to be able to find a way to continue to offer these types of things to you um, and have you provide us information about what else would be helpful to you. Thanks. I'm so glad it's been helpful. One more question I have for you before you guys go. Um, we just like for uh, being trainers, you know, we have to always think about the transfer of learning. So we'd like for you to think about and then share with us <coughs> One way this information uh, will help you with your work. Beth Sawyer is wondering if Catherine could share her training resources with smaller counties that don't have training staff. Absolutely, Beth. Contact me. Um, my in contact information will be at the end of the webinar. So feel free to contact me directly. And I, uh, I think there was one before this that just scrolled up for me. Um, somebody was wondering if this information would be shared with um, NC Fast staff. There are not plans to share this with NC staff. Um, NC Fast staff at this point. Um, however, uh, you are more than welcome to share these slides with your staff and go over the information that you learned today. Um, if you feel it's helpful, please please use whatever resources are available to you. Um, we'd be happy for you to do that. The re oh, and and uh, the recording. I've just been told uh, the whole recording for this time will be online, so that you could um, conceivably walk your staff through all of it um, and have great discussions. I would imagine identifying the type of problems that we are facing and deciding the appropriate action for the problem. Okay, that's good. I think it's very helpful just to you know think about challenges and problems in that way, so that we know what we're dealing with. 
Um, let's see, Candace says, the training has been great. It has affirmed for me that during this transition period, we as leaders can sharpen our adaptive skills. The day can become so filled with technical decisions. Yes, that's true. Great approach for looking at problems, a different way to think about solutions. Thank you. Thanks for that. While you guys are um, adding your last thoughts here, I'm just going to uh, direct you to where the information for much of this webinar has come from. It's from a book called The Work of Leadership by Ronald Heifetz and um, D.L. Laurie. And there, uh, this is a, uh, an article, actually. It comes from a, uh, Heifetz has written a lot of books. But this is the particular article that's attached to your handouts. Um, we invite you to read that. 